Welcome to the Introduction to Fiscal Sponsorship webinar. Um, like you can see, my name is Courtney Harge. I'm a program associate here in uh, fiscal sponsorship. Um, so I'm happy to uh, be on this webinar with you and to guide you through um, uh, what is going to be an overview of, of fiscal sponsorship practices um, and some specific information about our program. Sorry about that. We're going to go back. I don't know why. Excuse me. Sorry that it chooses to. There we go. So this is what we're going to cover. Fiscal sponsorship, what is it? What fiscal sponsorship best practices are? Some of the benefits of fiscal sponsorship, um, our eligibility requirements, and what we need on our application. Before we do that, I'm going to do a brief introduction of, of the team. So the six people you see here manage over 3,700 separate fiscally sponsored projects. Um, we are able to run what is the largest arts fiscal sponsorship program in the country with a lean staff of, of us six, of only four of us who are dedicated full-time just to the program. Um, I am in the center. My name is Courtney. Like I said, I'm a program associate here. Um, if you're going clockwise, uh, to the left of me is uh, Diane DiBasella, our Senior Program Director in charge of fiscal sponsorship. From there, we have Teresa Hubbard, one of our program specialists in fiscal sponsorship. At the bottom, we have Amanda Keating, also a program associate. Uh, to the right, we have Nathan Zabidio, um, a program specialist. And up top, we have Deborah Kwan, who is our membership associate. Um, she helps with not only our fiscal sponsorship, but also supporting all of our programs and in support of all of our fiscal sponsorship members. When you give us a call or shoot us an email, you could be working with any one of us at any given point, depending on what you may need. Um, to give you a little bit about myself, uh, I am a theater producer and director who is also a fiscally sponsored project of Fractured Atlas. Um, I I uh, like to say that it, it helps me not only talk the talk about how to administer your arts practice and to work with fiscal sponsorship, but it I, I walk the walk. It is something I do in my own producing and directing uh, theater career. So you can see all of us. There's me. There's Deborah. So. Before we get into some of the specifics about fiscal sponsorship, I'm going to talk to you a bit about our other programs. So insurance um, is another uh, one of our very popular programs. And uh, we provide a variety of insurance policies to help support you in your arts work and or arts business. Um, so we have policies that are discipline specific. Um, we've even had uh, Specifically, we just launched um, Burning Man specific policies. Uh, so we really do try to see what types of insurance can help you make your work uh, happen. Um, also, the majority of the staff at Fractured Atlas, uh, we are practicing artists. So we can understand the specific needs that you may have in regards to uh, executing your work. We also um, offer simple online tools for you to manage uh, your insurance policies as you need. Additionally, we have Artfully, which is a web-based business software for artists that helps you sell tickets, take donations, manage contacts, and do a variety of other things in service of managing your donors and patrons and ticket buyers. Um, it's an excellent online resource um, that has connections to fiscal sponsorship. And we also have integrations with MailChimp so you can manage your communication to your constituents um, as well as your donations and um, ticket sales. Lastly, we have SpaceFinder. Um, SpaceFinder is a tool to match artists uh, with unique spaces in their area. You can search by uh, type, by price, by location, um, and there's a variety of ways to match you to spaces that you may not otherwise see to help you execute your work. So feel free to browse our website, www.fracturedatlas.org, and see what other programs can be helpful um, in partnership with fiscal sponsorship. So what is fiscal sponsorship? 
Um, why is it something that could be helpful for you? Um, let's talk about that. So fiscal sponsorship is a legal agreement with a between an artist or an arts organization and a 501c3 federally tax exempt organization like Fractured Atlas. So it is in some ways a partnership, um, but it is an agreement that allows some of the benefits of our federal tax exemption uh, to be used by the artists in our program. It allows to open the door for more fundraising opportunities. Um, by being able to offer a tax deduction to your donors. Um, you also can be eligible for grants um, that may otherwise be restricted to uh, 501c3 organizations. So funds are given to the sponsor and are restricted to the specific purpose and use of your sponsee. So, Fractured Atlas would receive the funds um, on behalf of our fiscally sponsored projects, and then those funds are, are put into a dedicated fund for that project. Any type of fiscal sponsor um, can have uh, different types of relationships or different models. Um, the, the relationship we're talking about is a Model C relationship, where we as a fiscal sponsor receive the funds, and then we regrant those funds to you. You can use fiscal sponsorship to solicit contributions from individuals and institutions without having to go to, through the rigmarole of applying for your own 501c3 status. For some smaller projects or for some projects where you just don't wish to manage your own nonprofit organization with re separate reporting requirements, different state um, and, and local registrations, sometimes that is just more administration and or bureaucracy than any individual arts or arts organization artist or arts organization wants to handle fiscal sponsorship allows you to minimize that administrative burden um, while still having access to uh, some of the benefits of being a 501c3 organization so we'll talk a bit about what are some of the best practices for fiscal sponsorship in the arts um, so these are just things to keep in mind when searching for a fiscal sponsor, um, because we recognize that we may not be the right fiscal sponsor for you. While we manage, like I said, over 3,700 projects, while we are the largest arts fiscal sponsor in the country, um, we know that we are not necessarily for every project. Um, so there are several things that you should be looking for when you are shopping for a fiscal sponsor. Um, it is a, a relationship, so you should make sure that you are working with the right fit. So things to look in mind, keep in mind are the fee. All fiscal sponsors charge some sort of administrative fee, usually between 5 and 10 percent. Uh, Fractured Atlas has a fee of 7 percent, um, I will say, due to our partnership with Indiegogo, if you are raising funds through Indiegogo and our fiscal sponsorship partnership, um, those funds are 10%. Um, however, uh, different organizations can offer different free fee structures. Oversight. So the fiscal sponsor should provide oversight for the funds that are raised and how they are sp spent. There may be a request for receipts or invoices or contracts to show where the funds are being um, used. There may be a reimbursement model where they require you to spend the funds before they release them to you. Um, you should just be clear on what those oversight uh, boundaries and or guidelines are. Um, this is an ideal time whenever you are uh, talking to a fiscal sponsor or you're ap applying to a fiscal sponsor to, to review whatever their agreements or, or manuals may be. Um, they have different handbooks. Um, I will say that you know per our program manual or um, any type of fiscal sponsorship handbook is not necessarily suggested reading. It is required reading. It should be something that you're very clear on. And if you aren't clear, ask questions. Um, but that type of information that the, the distribution of the guidelines is, is a very clear step in understanding how fiscal sponsorship can work for you. Uh, many sponsors, including Fractured Atlas, um, will not own your work or any of the rights to it. Um, it's important to understand uh, what the relationship of your fiscal sponsor to your work is. Um, depending on a different model, there might be changes, but for the most part, um, 
your fiscal sponsor is not in fact a partnering in the creation of the work. They're supporting it administratively, but are not uh, owning the work. And an additional uh, note around uh, oversight is uh, a note to say that many sponsors, including Fractured Atlas, will review your grant proposals um, to make sure that they're appropriate and that the foundations are good matches. So in the oversight, when you are shopping for a fiscal sponsor, you may want to understand how do they support your grant proposals or how do they make sure that you are sending out the strongest materials possible. And then the written agreement. All fiscal sponsors should have some sort of written agreement for the fiscal sponsorship arrangement. This is a, a legal relationship um, that involves overlapping areas of, of tax law, of um, donor relations, of uh, just nonprofit law, uh, all of these things kind of connect. And so you should understand what your fiscal sponsor's liability is, what your liability is, and how this relationship is perceived. Um, that can be very helpful to understand what your requirements are or what your needs are to make this happen. So once you've found a fiscal sponsor, um, we can talk uh, a bit about the ben specific benefits of our program. So if, if Fractured Atlas is who you decide to work with, um, these are the things that uh, we can offer, which is helpful. So tax deductible contributions from individuals. Uh, this you know, can be one of the biggest boosts to a project where you can go to your friends, family, neighbors, audience, and say, you can support our project and receive the benefit of a tax deduction. Um, having the ability to give your donors a receipt for that tax deduction can can really boost uh, their relationship to the project, can reduce uh, can uh, reduce anybody's discomfort with kind of asking for money. Um, it can be very helpful um, in supporting your project. You also will have access to grants and corporate sponsorship, um, things that may be otherwise uh, unavailable to individual artists or to smaller projects. This uh, will allow you to uh, have access in a way that uh, may be otherwise unavailable. You also can have access to nonprofit rates, uh, particularly renters. Um, People who have uh, artistic rental space uh, tend to be able to offer a nonprofit rate to uh, people who are in fiscal sponsorship, so that is at the discretion of the venue. Um, but it, it, you can also sometimes get reduced rates on equipment or a few other things um, by being associated with our fiscal sponsorship program. You get the benefit of a review of solicitation materials. Um, collectively, that team you saw, I mean, we've reviewed thousands of grant materials, thousands of individual appeal letters. There is uh, a knowledge base that is helpful. We've also gotten feedback from funders, from uh, other donors. So we have this uh, collective experience that uh, you get to tap into as a fiscally sponsored project. You can take advantage of our crowdfunding partnerships. Uh, we currently have uh, partnerships with Indiegogo and Rocket Hub. Um, and, and that means you have access to what is one of the fastest growing sectors of, of donation, which is online crowdfunding campaigns. Um, this will uh, allow you to uh, be able to be a part of the zeitgeist and host your own campaign um, on a larger platform that can connect you with different audiences or can allow the audience you have to, you can harness their energy and momentum to create a, a campaign, uh, an event around your project. And for those projects located in uh, New York City specifically, uh, you have access to Materials for the Arts, which is a wonderful uh, resource. Um, it's a recycling program um, that is also a partnership with the New York City Department of Cultural Affairs, New York City Department of Education, and the um, New York City Department of uh, Waste Management, uh, where businesses can donate uh, materials to materials for the arts and um, people who are fiscally sponsored or nonprofits can have access to that resource for free um, where you can go into a giant warehouse and get carpet and office supplies and props and uh, any type of item that may be necessary to help support your work 
You also have access to the Theater Development Fund's costume collection, um, which is a resource of, of rentable costumes, uh, also in a warehouse in Queens that uh, hosts uh, different types of costumes from different periods, from different shows um, that have been donated by uh, various productions or costume houses um, and are accessible for um, some very reasonable rates. So these are just some of the benefits of fiscal sponsorship uh, that can be uh, yours if that is what you choose to do. So now we're going to get into some of the more uh, specific parts of our requirements for Fractured Atlas fiscal sponsorship. Um, like I said earlier, uh, each individual fiscal sponsor may have some of its own requirements. You have the tools to be able to see what um, ways to compare different types of fiscal sponsors, but this um, will let you know a bit about what we do specifically. So our first requirement for fiscal sponsorship is you have to be a member of Fractured Atlas. Um, so we are a membership organization. Um, we offer paid memberships at two separate levels. The professional level um, is $10 per month. Um, and that allows one person to have uh, administrative access to the membership um, and that allows you to be fiscally sponsored, that allows you to um, purchase insurance, uh, that allows you to have access to the majority of our paid programs. We also have the organization level, which is $20 per month, that allows up to three people to have administrative access on the membership. Um, still only allows for one fiscal sponsorship, but if you are, you know, a small team of people who will be administering um, your fiscal sponsorship or administering the membership, then the organization level uh, can be helpful for you. So we do need you to be a United States recognized legal entity with uh, an associated tax ID. Um, so what that means is you can be uh, an individual with a social security number. You can also be uh, an organization with a federal uh, employee identification number. We just need a, a US-based uh, tax identifier because uh, these funds are taxable. We do have to make sure that, um, that everybody is operating kind of under US tax law. We do have projects that are located outside of the US, uh, but they uh, have an associated US-based tax identifier. Um, so the individual organization must have an artistic focus or a strong arts component. So we, we are an arts organization. So what we are uh, looking to support or the, the, the types of projects that we can support are artistic projects. We, um, however, are not curating. So we are not looking at the quote unquote quality of your art. If it is art you believe in, we want you to make it happen. Um, but we are, we do want to make sure that the project itself is artistic. We also need to make sure that there is a public benefit. Um, and what that means is the public has to have access to this work in some way. So, you know, I, selfishly, I'm a theater producer. I want audiences to come see it. That is considered a public benefit. The public will have access to this work. Um, if you're a visual artist, are you going to be showing this work to someone? Um, public benefit doesn't necessarily mean it has to be free. What it means is that the public has to have access to this work. So you are allowed to sell tickets. You are allowed to sell admission. You are allowed to, in fact, sell the work. But we are very interested in knowing how will the public get to access your work. Um, we are also, uh, so these are the major things that we are looking for. Um, we are also looking uh, to have a longer conversation if you're looking at for-profit investors. Um, that can be um, detailed more specifically if you have uh, uh, specific questions about that process. Um, and while previously our projects could not work with for-profit for-profit investors and be fiscally sponsored. Um, we've recently expanded the guidelines to where there are some more requirements around it, but you are allowed to um, 
seek investors or have kind of for-profit distribution deals um, and be fiscally sponsored. We just have to, again, have a longer conversation about what the specifics of that are. So to become fiscally sponsored by Fractured Atlas, um, you Become a member of Fractured Atlas at www.fracturedatlas.org. Membership sign-up is very, very simple. Um, I would like to clarify, somebody has asked uh, if there will be a recording of this. And yes, uh, this is recorded. We will be, email, uh, we'll be emailing all the participants of this call the uh, video of this uh, webinar, um, as well as a copy of the slides. Sorry about that. There we go. So to become physically sponsored by Fractured Atlas, uh, join, like I said, become a member of Fractured Atlas at www.fracturedatlas.org. It's a very simple, very easy process. Um, should be very quick. So on the home page, you're going to click apply for sponsorship. Then you should read all the program info on the website. We can't cover everything in this presentation. It's also very, very clear. Um, we try to be as transparent about our processes as possible so you can see what we need. Um, you can also email us at support at fracturedatlas.org or give us a call at 1-888-692-7878. Um, that information will be available at the end of the webinar as well if you want to reach out. But um, we do try to keep as much information uh, as readily available as possible. You can also at that point read the fiscal sponsorship agreement. Um, that way you can see exactly what the terms of our agreement are and if there is um, anything you need additional clarification on. So once you've become a member, clicked apply for sponsorship, seen all of that information and read the agreement, you can enter the information about your project. Um, our application is fairly simple. We say it takes between 15 and 20 minutes. Um, and what we're looking for, um, which I'm going to go a, a bit more in depth into in a moment, but what we're really looking for is a sense of your project. Again, we are not trying to curate. We are not necessarily judging the quality of your work. We just want to know what do you want to do? What is the work you believe in and how can we um, understand it and understand what you are fundraising for? So the application, you start with the legal entity information. And like I said, that is the whether or not you're an individual or a corporation, or an LLC, or an unincorporated group with a tax identifier. Um, we just need to know who is the legal uh, entity associated with the contract. This person um, or entity will ultimately have the tax liability for this contract. Um, it can be updated at a later date. Uh, we just want to be very clear that you can update it. If you update it before December, then um, that legal entity update applies for everything in the tax year of that year. So let's say you were to be awarded fiscal sponsorship uh, now and you wanted to update your legal entity by December of this year, then any funds that you would have released in 2015 um, would go to the new legal entity. However, let's say that you were awarded fiscal sponsorship right now, um, but didn't change your legal entity until February of 2016, then all of your 2015 funds would be associated with the old legal entity, and the 2016 funds going forward would be associated with the new. So at this point, um, it, it can be adjusted, but when you apply, it's just important to consider who is going to be the legal applicant uh, and, and consider, consider the legal signatory of the fiscal sponsorship agreement. And then we want a description of your project. What we are really looking for in that is, is the breadth of activities um, more so than the depth. We want to know what are the, the activities that you will be fundraising for. What are you telling people that you're doing so that they can support? So if you are doing a theater project that may turn into an interactive film that you may then write a book about, 
let us know all of that. You don't have to just say, well, it's a theater project. Um, we are interested in understanding how do you want people to engage with this work and how do you want um, the work to be presented to the world. Um, so include, like I said, a, a, a very, a, a broad description of, of your project so that we know what all you'll be fundraising for. Um, we ask for the summary of qualifications. Um, and that's, again, just to get us an idea of what is the type of work you're doing and, and what makes you capable of doing this work. We want to make a, we want to see a connection between the work you're proposing and how um, your background up to this point has supported the work. Um, it's not necessarily weighted, but we do um, just want to see if there's a connection or who is the team you're assembled. It doesn't have to be a full resume. Bios are fine, um, but we're just trying to, again, get a sense of the project, get an understanding of, of what you're trying to accomplish. And lastly, uh, we need the budget. Um, and what the budget does is give us a broader sense of the scale and scope of the work. Um, I always like to say that a budget is a living document. So we understand that budgets change. You're not locking yourself into any particular amount at this point. But a good budget should accurately show what it would take to execute your project or organization in the way that you feel it needs to be done. It should include paying yourself and your artists. It should include the costs of things that you may get donated, but that still have a cost. We un we want to understand how big is the project. What are the what are your goals around it? What is your, what is your plan around it? And a budget very accurately um, helps us understand that. It is also not a weighted part of the application. Um, we aren't looking for a budget to be a particular number. It can't be. We have no limits. We have no maximums. Um, so it can't necessarily be too big or too small. We just want to know what do you think it will take financially to make this project happen. We do not need you to have any funds raised at this point um, for that budget. We just need to know what you think you're going to get and where you think those funds will come from. So here's a bit more about the process. When are applications due? We review applications monthly. So applications are due at 11.59 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the last day of the month, every month. So October 30, 31st, this past Saturday, was our most recent deadline. Um, they are reviewed uh, at the beginning of uh, the following month. So any application received between October 1st and October 31st is going to be reviewed at the same time. This can um, allow you to better plan. Um, because some people, while we do appreciate you getting in applications early, that does not necessarily mean it will be reviewed earlier. We try to give everybody the same review process. And um, so if it's received at all in October, it will be reviewed in the same space. Who reviews them? Um, this actually goes through a two-step review process. Um, so first, a staff member reviews your application. And again, we are curating. Um, what that staff member is looking for is clarity. If there's questions around um, the investors that I talked about, or if we um, just get a sense that they're, we aren't sure about what the artistic component of your project is, um, that staff reviewer is made to catch those. And what will happen is the staff reviewer will reach out to you for clarification. We aren't just um, outright rejecting applications with no follow-up or no um, uh, opportunity for conversation. We want to make sure that we understand the work that you want to do and uh, we'll work with you to make sure that we understand how it is a fit for our program. So once the staff review happens, then our board of directors does the final review and they are the only ones who can approve or uh, reject an application. Um, so they, uh, again, we the staff is here to help you if you have questions, if you need clarity around things, um, but we make sure that once the board gets it, they, you know, they have the say um, and they um, make that decision. So 
We try to make sure that they are empowered with um, all of the information they can have. Um, again, we try to be in conversation with any applications that we have not um, that we have questions about, um, and we um, also can invite projects to reapply um, if they feel they need to. So, when will you hear back? Um, so every application received by the last day of the month uh, will be reviewed by the 15th of the following month. So every application that we received between October 1st and October 31st will be um, notified of either um, of their acceptance or, um, or not by uh, November 15th. Um, we try to be very clear about that. We do notify via email. So it is important that when you are completing your application or when you're signing up for membership, that you use an email that you check, that you are actively engaged in, because that is where the majority of our notifications will will help um, will, or will happen. So as I said, our criteria, we do not judge the quality of your work. We need to see that it is artistic, that it is uh, ultimately nonprofit in nature, although again, there is some room around that, and that there is a public benefit. That's uh, what we're asking for. And if we feel like something isn't fitting those things, we will follow up and ask questions to make sure that we better understand what's happening. So, You've completed the application, you've gotten a notification, and you're sponsored. What do you do first? Reading. Reading is what you should do first. First, read the program manual and read the fiscal sponsorship agreement. Um, we oftentimes get the questions like, hey, I was just accepted into fiscal sponsorship and I know I'm going to read it, but how do I do this? And while we're happy to help, it's important to understand that that information is right there for you. We very much try to empower our artists to be able to manage their fiscal sponsorship from the get-go. There are definitely some important moments where you should be contacting us. We have some important kind of text reviews. We have um, the opportunity for a consultation where you can call us and we can talk you through some of your fundraising strategies. All of the things are, are possible, but for the most part, what you need to do is available to you um, immediately. Um, so read through those things um, as you can. You should start thinking about your fundraising strategy. Um, again, we are happy to have consultations to talk to you about how you can start, but you should really think about where is your audience, who do you want to reach out to, and what is your timeline looking like? That will uh, offer you the, the opportunity to uh, really have a focused conversation around what um, you may need uh, and, and how to, to get there, because there is... Um, a multitude of ways for you to be able to fundraise for your project. Um, there are uh, infinite options. And so you really want to know, well, what are the best options for you? You will also should explore the My Fiscal Sponsorship page on the website. Once you're fiscally sponsored, there is um, the My Fiscal Sponsorship page will be available, and it has a lot of resources, including the program manual, including some templates, including um, some of our forms and requirements. It's all available to you, so you should explore it to see things like where your donation history and donor info is going to live, um, where the ability to see your fund balance and where your fund requests would be, um, and you can see those those templates, um, including a few other things. So it's an opportunity to uh, really explore the page and see what can happen for you um, on your own. Um, so very briefly, we're going to open up for questions. So I'm happy to answer whatever you may need. Um, just so you know, there are several webinars in this series. We do um, webinars every Tuesday at 730. So these are some of the ones that we offer. But we're always um, happy to uh, answer your questions um, outside of that. Or, and or if there's a past webinar you're interested in, um, you're welcome to email us and we can send those to you. So. Um, while you see those, uh, please feel free to type your questions in the questions box. These are also the other ways outside of this webinar that you can uh, contact uh, any one of the fiscal sponsorship staff. And I'm going to get to some of your questions. 
uh, this question is for the, the main tax ID who agrees to take on the relationship with Fractured Atlas, do we send a 1099 or similar form of, at the end of the year? Um, and that depends on the type of uh, entity that is associated with uh, Fractured Atlas. We send 1099 miscellaneous to um, anyone who isn't a corporation. So I believe we send it to LLCs. We do send it to um, uh, individuals. Um, and the 1099 shows every dollar released on behalf of your project. Um, so yes, we do send them, um, but for corporations, we do not. Sorry. This is a very good question. So uh, somebody says that they read in the agreement that funds cannot be used, raised for the purposes of awards. Um, the example is if there is a piano competition, can funds uh, be given to the competitors? Um, so can funds raised through Fractured Atlas be given to the competitors? Um, and that is a good question. And the answer is no. You cannot raise funds through fiscal sponsorship that you are then going to give to someone as a kind of unrestricted grant or award. Um, what you could feasibly do is raise funds for this quote unquote award and then pay a direct expense for that uh, for that winner. So um, let's say the winner of this piano competition actually won a piano. You can't give the winner the $2,000 or whatever it would cost to uh, win a piano, but you could feasibly buy the piano directly and then give that to the project, to the, to the winner of the competition. Um, I'm also happy to talk more specifically um, offline uh, about how those types of things can work uh, via email or via the phone number that is um, showing on your screen. But uh, when we say that funds can't be used for awards, we are saying that you cannot raise funds through fiscal sponsorship that then you then redistribute in kind of unrestricted grants to other individuals. This next question is, where are funds released to? Will you have to pay tax on those funds or will you be able to open a bank account with tax exemption via Fractured Atlas? So there are three separate questions in there and I'm gonna a, a, a attack each one. So funds are released via electronic funds transfer to a, a bank account determined by the project. Um, because these funds are considered grant income, there is a tax liability associated with it. So the recipient of the funds, whoever that legal entity associated with the fiscal sponsorship is, may have to pay taxes on those funds. That very much depends on their entity type, on um, how much the funds are, on whether or not there are, um, which there should be, but on whether or not there are um, documented expenses that can cancel out those funds. Fractured Atlas strongly suggests that you work with an attorney or an accountant to make sure that you understand what your specific tax liability would be. But ultimately, if the funds are released to you, there is a tax liability associated. Lastly, um, this question is, will you be able to open a bank account with tax exemption via Fractured Atlas? Because you are not a tax exempt organization. You are just using some of the benefits of Fractured Atlas's tax exemption. Um, you cannot open a tax exempt bank account associated with Fractured Atlas or using Fractured Atlas's name. All bank accounts have to be in either the name of you as an individual or the legal entity associated with it, but they cannot be associated with Fractured Atlas. This follow-up question is when we receive funds, um, is it up to the project to pay the expenses for our project? Um, yes, we understand that projects change, that some things get more expensive. We ask that funds are spent within 90 days of a request. So if you receive funds um, from, if you're requesting funds from us, you have 90 days to spend them, or you should, if, if not, you should just give them back to uh, Fractured Atlas. They would go back in your fund. Um, we do have an annual report that we ask for every year that allows you to basically reconcile whether or not your um, 
uh, what what funds were requested versus what funds were actually spent. So that allows you to be able to, uh, you know, get your books in order, make sure your um, your report and your finances are there. Um, but we don't necessarily approve individual expenses. We do reserve the right to ask for documentation for any fund release offered. Um, so any fund release request uh, made, but we require documentation for any fund release that is $5,000 or over. So we will we will require that, we will ask for it at that point, but anything less than that, um, we reserve the right to require it, but may not. Uh, this additional question is, can Fractured Atlas give us the ability to make tax-exempt purchases on needed items? Um, the answer is no. Uh, sales tax exempt exemption is handled at the state level, um, and it is, in fact, not really transferable. We cannot um, make tax-exempt purchases on your behalf. Um, however, we... Uh, as I mentioned before, we can help support nonprofit rates. So sometimes that can help balance it, it out, but we do not uh, support uh, projects making tax exempt purchases uh, through us. Uh, the question, just to clarify, is if the funds that are requested are used completely, then they won't be taxed. And I want to be very clear that we do not give official tax advice. We are not a tax accountants. We are not attorneys. Um, so each individual liability is different. So I cannot answer whether or not they will or won't be taxed. Um, if you can document that those that there was expenses, that those funds were used for expenses, then um, more than likely you will not be taxed on them, but that really depends on the type of entity you are, the type of filing you do, and what you can work out with your accountant. Um, it is very important to, to follow up and really make sure that you understand your individual needs. This question is, so if funds are released to me um, as the project and I pay others, I have to track that and file 1099s for them as necessary. That is correct. If you are uh, releasing what I believe it's greater than $600 to an individual, you should have a W-9 and you should um, be filing 1099s for them. Um, there is no minimum amount that uh, is not supposed to be reported to the IRS. Ideally, you're supposed to be reporting any income you receive, um, but you should work with your accountant to figure out exactly what your needs are around that. But we are not issuing 1099s to the people you pay on your behalf. This question is, if we raise more funds than we need, uh, do you maintain the funds? Does Fractured Atlas maintain the funds in our account indefinitely? Um, I'm happy to answer that question when that happens, but it as, as much success as we've seen our projects have, we just find that there are always expenses. Most often what happens is people choose not to pay themselves for uh, the work that they've been doing. And so oftentimes any quote unquote excess funds are go going toward the deficit of not paying yourselves or your artists. So um, we do not maintain the funds in our account indefinitely. If there comes a moment where there um where you feel like there are more funds than you can spend, we are happy to work that out on a case-by-case -case basis. But for the most part, the, there are expenses associated with those funds and they will be uh, used. Um, who sends the receipts for donations? Fractured Atlas uh, does send the official tax receipt to donors um, for donations received through fiscal sponsorship. However, we encourage all of our projects to maintain a personal relationship with their donors and reach out to them directly. Um, there should be a, uh, a some type of correspondence from the project directly to the donor when a donation is received.
um, this can the project be ongoing or does there need to be an end date or a finite date? Um, the project can be ongoing. Yes, we do not, not have to have an end date uh, for uh, any particular project. Um, we do want to make sure that we understand what the scope of the project is. Like we want to make sure we understand what exactly is happening, but that does not mean that the project can't be, um, it has to, that the project has to end. Are ticket sales considered tax deductible donations? That is a very good question. And the answer is no. Ticket sales are considered earned income. What that means is the donor is, or sorry, the donor or ticket buyer in this case is giving an amount and they are getting that amount of service, either CD, performance, access in return. Um, a donation has to, in fact, for it to be considered a donation, has to have this thing called donative intent. And what that means is that the, the donor is expecting nothing in return. So when a donor gives $100 um, and wants nothing in return, they what they can get is the tax deduction in return. And that's it. That's donative intent. If the donor is buying a $100 ticket to an event, they are considered to be getting $100 worth of performance in return, and therefore they cannot get a tax deduction as well. So for every dollar spent, you can only get uh, a benefit that is equal to that. You cannot get in double benefits, which would be the a dollar's worth of performance and a dollar's worth of tax deduction. Um, to clarify the 1099s, we issue 1099s to any of our projects that released funds that are not um, corporations um, and that uh, release the minimum, the $600, I believe, is the is a federal minimum. So, um, uh, and, and what that means is that $600, we have to report that 1099 to both the IRS and to the project. So that is when we issue 1099s. This clarifica clarification around the uh, donation. Uh, so somebody says they attend tons of concerts that su say suggested donation and the ticket buyers get a tax receipt. How is it different? Um, and the fact is for suggested donations, you can walk into that concert for free. You are getting a free concert, but they are asking you to donate. Um, and so the donation is technically at that point separate from the ticket, the ticket purchase. Um, you could not give them anything and get the benefit of this concert. Um, so suggested donation is helpful, but because you are donating um, technically separate from attending the concert, even if you are donating at the concert, it is considered um, a donation. It is considered to have donative intent and it is not, it is uh, therefore eligible for tax deduction. Thank you gifts um, can be given at different levels of giving. Uh, we do have a, a, a an option called giving levels where you can list the intended donation amount and the value of any goods or services that, services that they're receiving in return, which means uh, that let's say somebody is donating that same $100, but you're giving them a $25 dinner in return then actually only $75 of that donation is eligible for a tax deduction. Um, this information is uh, gone into a little bit more in depth in our program manual once you're accepted to fiscal sponsorship. Um, but we ask for, for those types of giving levels uh, for Fractured Atlas has approval so we can make sure that the things you're giving away are um, eligible for this type of, of, of donation that they are accurately accounted for. Um, and so that just generally becomes a longer conversation. This is a question. Are funds taxable to the donation, to the organization or to the project when they are raised or when they release, when they are released? Uh, so funds are taxable to the project uh, when they are released to the project. So let's say you are approved for fiscal sponsorship today and you raise $10,000, but you aren't actually incurring expenses until 2016. Those $10,000 could sit in your Fractured Atlas fiscally sponsored fund uh, for all of 2015 and the remainder of 2015, and you wouldn't have any 
any tax liability on it. When you requested those funds, let's say you requested them in 2016, then you would incur the tax liability um, and would have to report them as necessary. Any fund raised through Factored Atlas have to be spent in the USA? That is a good question. Um, we do require a US-based bank account to uh, release the funds to. We do require that the funds are released in US dollars. However, um, as long as you can document how those funds are used um, in service of your project, uh, you can, in fact, um, spend them outside of the US. Um, we just have to release them to you, to your US-based bank in uh, US dollars. Um, this question is about Artfully, is the, the the split donation that I talked about where for $100, they get the $75 donation and the $25 dinner. Is that possible to market through Artfully, our ticketing service? And the answer is uh, no, not at this point. Um, you can sell the, 70, sorry, sell the $25 ticket there, and you can separately through Artfully ask for the $75 donation, but you cannot... Um, have a ticket that is both uh, a, a donation and earned income uh, at this time. If you have uh, questions about a for-profit sponsorship or if you're looking for um, information about our ability to work with for-profit investors, I suggest you send an email directly to support at fracturedatlas.org with the details of your specific situation and what you're looking to find. Um, that will be the best way to find the information you may need. Um, this question is clarifying if we consider Puerto Rico or other U.S. territories outside of the USA. Um, I, I don't, I believe that we consider U.S. territories as part of the U.S., but it really depends on uh, on your tax ID on, on, and on whether the bank um, considers it, it, it itself uh, in the U.S. Um, it can depend, but that um, we have worked with some of those territories in the past. Um, I believe that is the last question. Does uh, anybody else have anything they would like to ask? Uh, this question is uh, set up some bank accounts for incoming electronic funds only, not outgoing. They intend to write checks for outgoing expenses. Um, that is fine. We don't have any particular requirements about about bank account types, I just strongly suggest that you talk to your accountant or um, business manager or attorney, whomever um, can accurately advise you on your specific setup based on your uh, specific situation. But um, we are, are okay with whatever type of bank you have. Um, if a project is a continuous group creation through a collective, are we still eligible for fiscal sponsorship? Yes. If you guys are making work that is continually evolving, um, that can definitely be fiscally sponsored. We just want to understand kind of what genre or genres or disciplines you're working in, what the kind of goal of the work is. And, and by goal, I don't necessarily mean a specific performance necessarily, um, but uh, what is the kind of mission of your work? What is the work you're doing? How does that uh how is that progressing? And how do you think f fundraising and or fiscal sponsorship can help support that? The question is, oh, so if the project is the major donor at this point, um, this person doesn't quite know what we need to know about the finances. Do you only have to account for the sponsored entities finances? Um, Again, we aren't actually particularly interested in your specific finances. We want to know the budget of the project. So what are the costs? Uh, 
you think the project has incurred, what type of money has gone into the project. Um, but we aren't monitoring your finances. We just want to understand what the project costs are. And if it's largely just been you spending money at this project, it is important to think just a step beyond that to see, well, what, how do I want other people to contribute? How do I want the project to grow? This question, should I pass my funds through you? So if it is your project and you are the donor, um, I sh you are you can do that. I strongly suggest that you do not donate through us, partially uh, for a few reasons. One, um, you're going to lose the 7%, right? So let's say you have $100 that you want to spend on your project, so you could just buy $100 worth of stuff, or you could donate $100 to your project through Fractured Atlas, um, but you're going to lose $7 on that just off the gate. So that's going to make less money for your project, uh, for ultimately toward getting your project done. Two, um, for the tax deduction, oftentimes uh, what, uh, what accountants or what the IRS wants is a what's called an arm's length uh, relationship. They want they want you to be at arm's length from the uh, donation. So if you are donating to your project and you are ultimately the legal recipient of the funds, that's technically considered the same transaction. It's considered that the money didn't go anywhere. So not only are you giving us your seven dollars, you're actually not going to be able to get the tax deduction on those funds. So if you are the project, um, you should pay for your your uh, expenses directly um, because uh, the, the there is very little benefit to passing quote unquote the funds through us. We also don't like the term pass through. Um, it, a fiscal sponsor or or donating through your fiscal sponsorship fund is um, preferred. Um, this is the question is, why do we require $1,000 to be raised before one can solicit grants? Is that Fractured Atlas or does it come from foundations? And the answer is both. Um, foundations told us frequently uh, that they wanted to see that a project had raised $1,000 um, at a minimum before they felt that they were competitive um, in the grant process. So um, that policy was passed on to us from many a foundation. And so it has become, um, it is fractured Atlas policy that we don't uh, allow our projects to apply for grants without proof that they've raised a thousand dollars. So that can be, um, if you've had a crowdfunding campaign in the last two years, it can be if you have a letter from a donor saying that, you know, we've contributed up to this point or a letter from a few donors. Um, if you have records that show that people have donated, so not bought tickets or bought work, but have donated to your project to the tune of $1,000, we can waive that requirement for you. Sorry. Um, and I'm still here to answer questions. I apologize that the uh, film has left. Um, LLCs can be fiscally sponsored. Yes. Um, we, we work with LLCs frequently. More questions? Thank you. Happy to help. Yes. You. Uh, this question is, can you pay yourself a salary via the funds raised? Yes, you can. We want our artists to be able to pay themselves. Um, so we think, we think it's important. So... Um, your budget should include the cost to pay yourself and your artists. Um, thank you all very much for your time. This has been very informative. I, I'm glad that you guys are an engaged um, and informed group. Um, if you have other questions, feel free to reach out uh, at support at fracturedatlas.org or um, at the number 1-888-692-7878. Um, we'll be happy to help. Um, within the By the end of the week, uh, you should receive the uh, video and the uh, handouts, the PDF of the this webinar. Um, and I really appreciate uh, your support um, and look forward to working with all of you in the future. So um, I hope you enjoy your evening. Thank you all very much for all of your kind words. I really appreciate it. And um, you guys have a great night, okay? <laughs>